Where do new genes come from? What's the origin of genetic information? I've addressed that topic a number of times in different videos, but I thought I would take another crack at it. It's just going to be another example of what is a very common method of showing how new genes originate uh, in genomes and species over time. And this one comes from a paper just released a few days ago in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science. Uh, this paper, A Tale of Two Copies. Two copies? Two copies of what? Well, two copies of a gene, and that gives you a sense of what's happening here. This gene has copied itself in one lineage of moths, and that new copy of the gene has found a new function. So let's talk about how we know that there was only one copy that has become two copies and that that second copy has a new function compared to the old function and thus fulfills what I would say is a requirement of the expectation of showing how new genetic information arises all right, from prior genetic information uh, in the genome. I'm just gonna take a very quick look, very quick read of this paper I'm just going to read the abstract. It's a fairly technical abstract, but I want to pull a couple things out of it. And then after I cover the abstract, we'll take a look at well, just a couple figures that illustrate a couple points about the origin of genetic information from gene duplications. So let's take a crack at that coming up next. So here we are. We're at the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. This is an open access uh, article. Anyone can read it. I will provide a link uh, below this video. And the title of our paper is A Tale of Two Copies, Evolutionary Trajectories of Moth Pheromone Receptors. So moths produce pheromones, chemicals, and I'll show you some examples of these. Uh, they produce a chemical, the, the female produces a chemical, which then she emits, right? And then for the male to find the female, he has antenna, and those antenna have receptors. And what are, recept what are biological receptors? In this case, biological receptors are proteins. Proteins that have particular shapes and charges that interact with chemicals in the environment. And so they can sense their environment. They can sense the chemicals that are airborne and identify a particular chemical they know comes from the female of the species. And then the percentage or the concentration of that chemical also can be determined by, uh, in many cases, the, the differences between the two antenna. All right, there's a little bit more. I'm sensing more on this side than this side, so there must be a higher concentration in this direction, and it can turn its body to fly toward the higher concentration. Presumably, wherever the, where the highest concentration is is going to be where the female is, right? So it's a homing beacon all right, for the male to be able to find the female. An interesting thing about moths and many, many, many other different species is that uh, this can be very, the, the particular pheromone that's used by the female can be very specific, very specific, specific to the species, right? Because females of one species don't necessarily want to attract the males of another species. So when we look at different species of moths, different species of ants, different species of, a, like I said, hundreds of thousands of other different organisms, we typically find that there is a either a pheromone, a specific molecule that's being made that's unique to that particular species. Or if they don't make a unique molecule, they make a mixture of molecules that might, uh, that might uh, be common among different species, but they make a certain mix of that, right? 75% of this and 20% of that and 5% of that and the male then is attracted to that particular mix of molecules versus another species which produces a different mix, all right, ratio of those molecules. All right, so that's the background in terms of, right, you've got pheromones produced and you have receptors. The receptors are proteins. Proteins are encoded by genetic information by genes. So ultimately, there is genetic information that encodes for the receptors allowing the males to identify this particular pheromone. Different pheromones require different receptors. Different receptors then require different proteins, which require different DNA sequences uh, in these different species. All right, so let's take a look at how then, when you have one species of moth and that species then divides into multiple different species of moths over time. 
each of which have their different pheromone receptor systems. How does how do you create new pheromone receptor systems such that you can continue to you have separate species, right? One of the ways that those species might have diverged is in different populations. One population began to use a different pheromone or have a slightly different receptor. And over time, as those receptors and pheromones become more different in one population, they no longer can interact well with another population of those moths and therefore are on their way to becoming new species or, in fact, are new species at some point. All right, so back to this paper. I'm going to read this paper by Lee et al., uh, just accepted in PNAS April 6, 2023. And let's read the abstract. I promise we won't be going into a lot of detail in this paper. I'm going to just use a couple figures to, to make the point about gene duplications. Pheromone communication is an essential component of reproductive isolation in animals. I, I just explained that, right? Pheromones, different pheromones and different species allow different species to remain isolated from each other and not mix their DNA through hybridization because they are leading themselves to the right mates. As such, evolution of pheromone signaling can be linked to, linked to speciation. For example, the evolution of sex pheromones is thought to have played a major role in the diversification of moss. As the sex pheromone itself slightly changes over time in different locations and different populations, those populations become more isolated from one another and becomes more difficult for them to uh, interact with each other. <laughs> By interact, I mean genetically interact, all right, have re reproduce with one another. In crop pest, uh, Spondoptera littoralis and Spondoptera litura. These are two different known species for a long time that have identified in the literature for, for hundreds of years. But they're very, very similar uh, moths. The major component of sex pheromone blend, right? They produce a number of different sex pheromones in a particular combination, right? Ratio is ZE911 tetradecadienyl acid, which is lacking in other Spendoptera species. Okay, so that's this is something they had discovered, the, some of these authors had discovered in earlier research of these two particular moths, is that they were studying their pheromones. Typically, we, we try to understand their pheromones because if you're able to produce chemicals that block their pheromones, you can block them from, re, from reproducing. So if they're particular crop pests, right, and you're a company and you're interested in what are we going to use as a chemical in order to stop their reproduction and therefore get rid of that particular moth, you're going to be interested in their sex pheromones, right? So that's, that's part of the base reason for some of this research. So they're looking at these, a, a number, there's a whole you know, 14 or 15 different species of, of Spondoptera. Uh, these two particular ones are of special interest because they're crop pressed, crop pressed, can't, crop pests, can't speak today. They discover that in these two particular species, there's this particular pheromone, which seems to be lacking in other species, which raises the question, well, where did that pheromone come from? Like, what's the origin of that particular pheromone? And then there must be a receptor for that particular pheromone. Um, this indicates a major shift occurred in their common ancestor. These two are th have been thought for a long time to share a common ancestor. They're very similar to each other compared to the other Spondoptera species. So it's thought that at some point in the past, there weren't two different species, Litteralis and Litura. There was just simply one species of Spondoptera, whatever you would want to call that common ancestor. And then there's the other species. right? And in that particular one, they're suggesting that there must have been some shift right, in their sex pheromone system. It has been shown recently that literalis, that this compound is detected with high specificity by an atypical pheromone receptor named slit ORF. All right, OR stands for olfactory receptor 5. Here we study the evolutionary history through functional characterization of receptors from different Spondoptera species. All right, functional characterization means that they're going to characterize the actual function of different receptors, meaning they're going to express the receptors and then test the receptors to see what chemicals are actually activated by those particular receptors. And I'll explain a little bit about how they do that in a moment. Uh, the olfactory 5 orthologs in Exigena and uh, I can't pronounce these different species exhibited a broad tuning to several pheromone compounds. So what they found is this same olfactory receptor gene, right, or receptor, the protein, uh, 
uh, has a broad tuning to multiple different pheromone compounds. So you can think of it as this is a protein that these males produce and females also actually make this receptor as well in lesser extent. These males produce this olfactory receptor and they then are receiving signals and the signals they receive can come from a broad range of pheromone compounds. Uh, most of these pheromones are chemically in the same kind of class. They're very similar chemicals. They're just slight variations of each other. And so olfactory receptors could be finely tuned, or right, highly tuned, meaning this olfactory receptor has a particular shape and charge that only will interact with a specific molecule out there. Or it could be like, eh, I'm kind of a generalist. I have a shape and charge that will interact with 10 different versions of this hormone class. And therefore, I'm broadly tuned. I can kind of pick up on a whole bunch of different signals with one particular receptor. All right, so in these other two species, they're broadly tuned. The same, the same gene making the same type of protein, but obviously it must be slightly different because one's broadly and one's more specific. So there's going to be genetic changes there. There's going to be mutations such that one of them has become more specific, the other one more broad. We evidenced a duplication of ORA5. Now, while they were looking at this particular gene, olfactory receptor number five, out of, I think it's like 72 different receptor uh, proteins um, that moths make. You and I have thou uh, hundreds and hundreds of olfactory receptors like in our noses. When they were investigating ol olfactory receptor number five in these four different species, they found out that there was another olfactory receptor that was very similar to those two. So we evidenced what we think is and claim is a duplication of this receptor in the common ancestor of these other two species. Right. The graphic will illustrate this much better than my waving my arms around and talking, but let's get through the, the abstract to, to set the stage. Uh, one duplicate is also broadly tuned, while the other is specific to uh, 911 tetradecadienyl acetate. So for one species, or for both species, they have this extra copy of a gene. They have a duplicate copy of OR5, which they're going to now call something different. We're going to call OR75. By using, now here's where, this is one of the reasons I, I thought this article would be interesting as well. It's not just the gene duplication part. It's how they tested the idea of gene duplication, how they tested this idea of the origin of new genetic information. By using ancestral gene resurrection, I mean, like, what is that? Ancestral gene resurrection. So what ancestral gene resurrection is, it's kind of what exactly what it sounds like. You predict what the ancestor of this gene was. So at some point when the gene uh, copied itself in the ancestor of these two species, sometime long ago, that gene had a particular sequence. That sequence was probably very similar to the other gene, right? Because it just duplicated it. Today, the sequence is quite different than the other gene. But in the past, it would have been similar to that other gene. So what they do is they predict, looking at the sequences today, and they predict all the different mutations that must have occurred such that they would have a common ancestor, right? In other words, they're predicting what the common ancestral sequence is. This is what phylogenetic, many types of phylogenetic analyses are doing, is they're actually predicting what past sequences were in common ancestors, and then how those sequences change to give us the current sequences we have today in different species. So you're, you're reconstructing the ancestral sequence, the ancient genome of these organisms, and then you're resurrecting it. And you're really like, like, how do you resurrect that? Well, once you have the sequence, once you have the predicted sequence, you can then um, actually construct that sequence. You can synthesize it, right? Here's the sequence. I'm going to synthesize that sequence and make that actual DNA piece. And then you're going to insert that piece of sequence into a living organism, an organism alive today. In this case, they do it into Drosophila. It's hard to do it in these particular moths. They put it into Drosophila because we've worked so much on Drosophila. We know we have all these tools and techniques for replacing genes in Drosophila. They take this gene that's resurrected, they put it into Drosophila and turn that gene on in Drosophila and have it make that receptor. And they know where Drosophila receptor genes are. They can basically replace the Drosophila gene receptor, put in this moth version, an ancestral moth version, 
have it express it on its antenna, and then they can do all the different kinds of tests, right? They can take all the different kinds of chemicals, and that's what they've done. They've taken a wide suite of 18 different pheromones that moths make, and they basically make that chemical, synthesize it, and then they waft it at the Drosophila, and they can test, the, there's a whole bunch of sophisticated ways they can see how the Drosophila is responding to those particular chemicals and whether that chem sorry, where that chemical is actually um, interacting with that particular receptor and sending the signal to the esophagus like, oh yeah, there's that chemical, there's that pheromone, right? So they can get a whole bunch of data on which chemicals interact, which pheromones interact with that particular receptor and how strong the response is. So you can test an ancient version of a gene that doesn't exist today. And you can say an organism that had that particular version of the gene, was it broadly fine-tuned? Did it, did it respond to 10 different chemicals or did it only respond to one? And then what you can do is, this is what's really awesome, right? You can uh, take the ancestral version of the gene and then you can say, well, in order to get from the ancestor to the common day, the, the, the today's version of the gene, there's been eight different amino acid changes. And they know all those amino acid changes are right there in the major pocket where the interaction is going to happen with the chemical. And so presumably those amino acid changes change the shape and charge of the protein uh, and therefore change its interaction with chemicals. And they can remake all those different pro all the different changes. They can say, OK, well, if you change this amino acid, because sometime in history there must have been a mutation that changed that amino acid, changed the shape of that pocket, what was the actual response? Like, what was the fitness value of that? Oh, well, we can just make that particular protein, put it in Drosophila, and see, like, what chemical does it respond to. And they can see how the change, how that particular gene has changed over time and how its interaction with chemicals has changed over time. So gone from broad to, oh, I made all these changes over time, and eventually I became more and more and more and more exclusive to a particular chemical. And so in this species that's becoming a new species, right? Because there used to be one species, now there's two. And in one of them, they have had different mutations. And those mutations have resulted in losing the broad spectrum analysis and becoming more finely tuned and or narrowly tuned to a specific chemical. And that chemical is actually a different molecule, a different pheromone than other moths are using. And so eventually they become tuned to a different molecule. Presumably at the same time, there's a female that's making a pheromone, right? And she is having mutations that have made slightly different molecule concoctions. And one of the things in that new concoction is this particular 911 tetradecal tetradecadienyl acetate. And as she's making it, she's probably making other molecules as well. And so even if the male wasn't very good at finding that particular molecule at first, he's finding the mate through uh, the other molecules in the cocktail. But eventually, as it has, the male has mutations and the female has mutations, making slightly different versions of this chemical, they become tuned to each other based on a different molecule versus their ancestor. And this particular study actually tests that idea directly by resurrecting all the different mutations from the past, from the common ancestor to the present, and showing how they've become adapted to becoming better at using a different pheromone in a different gene. Now, all this is really only possible because this organism duplicated its gene, keeping the old version of gene, which still can do the job it did before, but then adding a new responsibility, like changing it into uh, te uh, um, uh, receiving or re uh, interacting with a different molecule in its environment. Okay, finally, we identified, I got ahead of myself, identified eight amino acid positions in the binding pocket of the receptors whose evolution has been responsible for narrowing the response spectrum to a single ligand, sim single molecule. The evolution of the OR5 is a clear case of subfunctionalization that could have had a determinant impact on the speciation process in Spondoptera species. Subfunctionalization means, right, you had one function, it has a function, you copy the gene, now it can create subfunctions that are more uh, specific. Like the other one is still a general response, the other one can become more specific because it doesn't have to worry about identifying those other chemicals. All right, so that's the, that's the abstract. I'm not gonna go through all the details.
uh, in this paper, we're just going to go down and take a look at the primary. And let's spend a little bit of time with this figure. All right, part A over here uh, in the upper left-hand corner. A is a little phylogenetic tree, right? A relationship tree between S. Spondo spondophora uh, littoralis and then the other species that they're interested in. There's more than 10 other species, but they're more distantly related. So these are four closely related species. And the two they're most interested in are this littoralis and litura. But there's these other two species we're going to compare to. What this shows is that they looked at, uh, they, they have the entire genome of all these moths, right? So remember, we're in the age of genomes where it's easy to get an entire genome of organisms. So they just sequence the entire genome of all these moths. And then they search for all the olfactor receptor genes. And there's 72 of them that they predict are in the common ancestor of this group of four. 72 olfactor receptor genes. And the two, two of the species they predict have actually lost a couple and others they predict have actually gained genes over time. Let's not get into the weeds with how do you know whether you lost or gained, right? And how do you know how many were in the original? Because that's not critical for this particular uh, discussion. I'll just point, I just wanted to talk about the fact there's 70 some olfactory receptor genes and we're just focusing now on just a couple. Okay, so let's, we're just going to take one, what they're doing is just taking a snapshot of one very small section of the genome that they've honed in on as having uh, some interesting things going on when you compare the four different species. And so we here they have the genome structure called the, the gene synteny analysis, the comparison of the where the genes are in the order that they're in, and also the distance between the different genes. And so what we see is we see olfactory receptor number five, and then a little farther downstream, we've got uh, olfactory uh, number 38. And then if we looked at this other species here, we see that, oh, there's, okay, there's olfactory receptor five, and then a little farther down, there's olfactory receptor number 38. Now, the length of this black line between the two genes uh, is meaningful, right? The shorter the line, the less distance there is. It means the fewer bases are between. That's intergenic space, right? DNA sequence that's between genes. And it doesn't mean it's not important. There are, there are um, control elements and, and other things that go on that turn on genes and off genes and so forth in those areas. But you can see right away there's a difference between these two species. right? They have the same two genes. Um, and the two genes are next to each other, but they're at different distances from each other. And also the genes themselves are different sizes. Uh, I should point out that the dark purple represents the expressed DNA. That's called exons. Those are expressed. That means that's the portion of the coding sequence. That codes for proteins. And so if you put all the dark purple lines together, that represents the, the actual DNA sequence that's going to be read into a protein. The light purple region represents the introns. They're intervening sequences. They're intervening between the exons. And those portions will eventually be, after the, the sequence has been copied, will be cut out all the other little dark purple portions will be spliced together. And so that's what's happening in transcription and then translation. And then eventually the dark purple sections are translated into the protein and the protein is the receptor, right? And that's gonna be expressed on the surface of the antenna. Well, in most cases in the antenna, we're gonna see something else is gonna happen. Uh, and that, so that, that's, that is the gene and its product. All right, so then uh, you'll notice that in um, the second species here, we have another gene next to olfactory receptor number 38 uh, called olfactory receptor number 49. And 49 is not next to 38 in this other species. So that tells you there as well, there are differences between these species in terms of the structure of the genome. Actually, olfactory number 48, uh, sorry, 49, doesn't exist in exigua, right? Doesn't exist at all. It's not in the genome at all. So this is one of the reasons why they have this negative too. They think that that particular gene has been lost, right? I mean, the alternative is to say that, that it's been gained in the other species. One way or the other, it's, it's not there in one species, it is there in another species. So one species has a receptor that the other doesn't. What are receptors for? For receiving signals in, from the environment. So that species can receive and identify a signal in the environment that the other species can't. So that would be another reason why those two things are different species. You know, they have different 
capacities, different capabilities. Now, here's where it gets interesting, right? The two species they're interested in are Littoralis and Latura, two very similar species, sister species to one another. We call them sister species because we think they share a common ancestor. They are sisters to one another. And these two have olfactory receptor number five. They also have olfactory receptor number 38, and they have olfactory receptor number 49. But there's something between olfactory receptor number five and number 38. There is another olfactory receptor gene. And they're calling this olfactory receptor number 75. Uh, they've just given it that name because all the other names, numbers before 75 are taken up, right? In, in other genes of the genome. But they're coloring them purple. And the purple color represents, we think that this gene is actually related, very, very closely related to olfactory receptor number five. And we suggest the origin of 75 is from duplicating number five. So they think that back here in the past, uh, the common ancestor, right? Somewhere in that lineage of that new population that's becoming a new species separate from these other two species, they had a mistake in their genome. Their genome copied olfactory receptor number five and copied it and made two copies of it and they're right next to each other. And then over time in that common ancestor, olfactory receptor, the second copy, became more different, right? It experienced different mutations. And the two began to drift apart, or maybe better put, they were selected, all right? They were, they were directionally selected to become different over time because each one is taking on different roles, new roles compared to their ancestors, which don't have this extra copy, right? They're missing that piece of DNA, so they, they can't do anything about that. So also over time, as these two different, as that population, that ancestor divided into two new species themselves, they also experienced new changes. For one thing, there's 10,000 base pairs of sequence. That's what the double hash is here. They didn't want to draw it out in relative to the other genomes because then it would be so long it wouldn't fit on the page, right? So the hash marks represent, there's a giant chunk of 10,000 base pairs sitting right here between these two genes. Uh, whereas in the other species, that 10,000 base pairs is not there, All right? So we also have additional mutations and changes increasing and decreasing the sizes of the intergenic spacers between the genes. And you'll see the gene sizes themselves have changed. Olfactory number 75 is clearly larger in Latalaris than it is in, uh, in uh, Latura. Although I will point out the overall gene is larger, but that's because the introns have grown larger. Um, not that the coding sequence, right? The coding sequence is more conserved and it probably is the same size in the two. They make the same number of amino acids, but the different amino acids are different, right? We're going to show that because one of them is, is uh, narrowly tuned to a specific chemical and the other one is broadly tuned. And the only way you can have those two differences is they have to be genetically different. And the genetic difference must be in the coding sequence. And the coding sequence is that dark purple area. So if the dark purple area is the same length, A, T, Cs, and Gs, there must be differences in the A, T, Cs, and Gs resulting in different amino acids being produced. All right, so again, we're seeing genetic differences accrue between these two different species. All right, you can also see olfactory receptor number 49 down here. It also is quite a bit uh, different in size as well because the, in the introns have increased in size. Now, come over to figure C. Now, in figure C, what we see is a little phylogeny, which just represents the relationships. You can think of the branch lengths represent the amount of genetic difference. And so the known genetic difference between olfactory 38, 38, 38, 38, see all these green ones? So if you take the sequences of 38s here between the four different species, and you ask how similar are they, they're all really similar to one another. So you would go down and you'd say, there's a common ancestor between these four. They share a common ancestor. Why do they share a common ancestor? Because maybe the species they're in share a common ancestor. So if you go back far enough in time, those four different species are just one species that has olfactory receptor number 38. After each one divides and becomes new species, they are continuing to have slight changes to them. Not very many changes, but they've had a couple changes, a couple new mutations. And that's why they all are very similar to each other today, even though they're in four different species and they appear to all share a common ancestor. So we call that, that's a gene tree is what we're looking at. Rather than a species tree, it's a gene tree. But the gene tree is telling you the same thing that the species tree is telling you. 
the species relationships. Olfactory number 49, only three species have that. The other one doesn't have it. Uh, but the relationships between those, they're also very similar to one another. Uh, now we come to why are the 75 and the 5 both purple? Because if we look at their sequences and ask how similar they are to each other, we'll see that here's olfactory receptor number 5. You see here? 5, 5, 5, and 5. And those are the four different species. But so how are those four different species related to each other? You have two species, and then you have a sister relationship that's very close between these other two. That would be Latalis and Latura. In other words, the relationships between the fives is the same as the species relationships that are based on hundreds of genes that have been sequenced and compared. And also people's impression of the moths themselves just from their morphology and characteristics. This is what people thought, how they think they're related by common ancestry anyway. And then you wonder, where does olfactory receptor number 75 come from? Well, olfactory 75 is a sister to the, act, the ones in these two species, olfactory receptor number 5. They're most similar to olfactory receptor number 5. And you see they kind of fit within the variation of olfactory receptor number 75, but they themselves are different than the 5s, and they're very similar to one another. That's why they think that olfactory number 75 originated in the common ancestor of these two species and then was separated into those two different species and accrued a small amount of difference between each other since that point in time. All right, now let's just scroll down here and take a look at. Now what they've done is they've done the analysis to figure out how does, where is the olfactory receptor gene expressed? Where do these uh, animals make the receptor? And what we'll find is that in the antenna of, these are the two species that they're less interested in, what we call the outgroups, what thing they're comparing them to. And we'll see that uh, the male has a lot of expression of the olfactory receptor gene. Right? That's this tall bar here. And so normalized expression, how much it's expressed, and the female expresses about half as much. Uh, and then this other species, it's kind of similar, right? So they're, exp they're expressing these receptors, right, on their antenna. And then if we go over and look at, f at olfactory receptor 5 in Latura, what we find is now there's a difference in expression. We find that olfactory receptor number 5 is highly expressed in the male and not hardly expressed at all in the female. So that is a, a difference in their physiology, right? That's a difference in how they're expressing their genes in that species compared to those other two species. But now we also have an additional copy of the gene, 75. And what we see is that uh, olfactory receptor number 75 in Latura uh, is barely expressed at all right, in, in, the, um, in the antenna. And then let's look at this next figure here. What about uh, liter literalis? Uh, olfactory receptor number five, again, you have this difference, and you don't see much expression in olfactory receptor number 75, right? So Latura and Literalis, neither of them are expressing this protein in their antenna. But where are they ex expressing them? And what we see is that in Literalis, olfactory receptor number 75 suddenly has is doing something. It's being expressed in the antenna. Right, whereas a olfactory receptor number five, eh, not been turned on yet, not necessary, right? But something about in the life history in the larva, it's not receiving that particular hormone, doesn't need to. And olfactory receptor number seventy-five is doing something at that point, right? So I guess in the grand scheme of things, what this is showing is that there's differences of expression of olfactory receptor number five in different species. And then it really it's caused by the sudden appearance of olfactory receptor number 75. When 75 appears, all of a sudden the olfactory receptor number 5, its expression changes. And olfactory 75 is being expressed in a different way, right? Adding a new, we could call it a new characteristic, right, for this particular species. Okay, let me try to wrap this up by <laughs> giving you the quick overview of some other things that they've done because I, I mentioned them in the introduction. Um, these are the two species right up here 
that are there are there things that, that only only have olfactory receptor number five, right? They don't have 75. And when you do the analysis and ask what chemicals do they detect, this list on the side over here, I think this is like 18 or more different uh, chemicals, pheromones, and the plots here, the purple boxes here, the, the farther to the right they are, the more they're being, um, the more expression they have, no, let's say, the more sensitive they are to that particular chemical. And what we see is that they're sensitive to a whole bunch of different kinds of chemicals. So there's like a whole concoction. That's what we mean by it. it's broad. And then if you come over here and you get to um, literalis, right? And you look at olfactory receptor number five for both of these other species, you'll see that there's like one chemical and it's the uh, it's one particular form, right? And they're very sensitive to that particular chemical and they have like no reaction to the other chemicals. But the 75 one is reactive to a number of different uh, chemicals, uh, different versions of pheromones. All right, so again, just very broadly, we're seeing changes in the receptivity, all right, of the receptor to different pheromones in different groups. So this is how different, this is how species are distinguishing each other. And they're doing that through just minor tweaks and minor mutations to these particular proteins, creating different uh, pathways. And so, again, I'll say what they've done is they've, re they've looked at, predicted different proteins in ancestors between these four different species. These ancestors, they're considering to be like 10 million years old, too. So they're like going to say like 10 million years ago, there was this particular protein, right, in an ancestor. And it's not unlike any protein that's present today. It's similar, but it's different. And what did it sense, right? What what did it sense? Was it broad? Was it did it sense the, this particular pheromone or this other pheromone or to prefer what other pheromone? Well, we can test that because we can predict what that protein looked like. Then we can make that particular protein, and we can have Drosophila make that particular protein for us as a receptor. And then we can just throw at it a whole bunch of different hormones and see which res which ones respond, right? Which ones the Drosophila responds to. And we get these various plots that show us like, oh yeah, here's, here's well, what they've done here. Here's all the different chemicals and here's the ancestor of olfactory receptor number five, 10 million years ago. And it's, re it's, it's fairly uh, specific. And then we look at the ancestor to number 75 and then we look at a more recent ancestor of 75. And we look at the responses to that. Okay, I realize this is getting a little bit more complicated than I, than I wanted it to be. So probably best just to wrap it up really quick. I thought this graphic in the supplemental material probably helps show that the suite of chemicals that are used as pheromones in different moths, right, differ between different moths, and it's one of the things that makes them different species. So on the left-hand side is the relationship between a bunch of different moths, the phylogeny, right, the history of all these different species. And then on top, we have a list of a bunch of different um, molecule names, right, and those are all the different pheromones. And then down here on the right-hand side, is a, a little graphic depicting the molecule itself. So they're really simple molecules, right? A long chain with a little oxygen, uh, oxygenated portion at the end. So these are carbon, nitrogen, and there's some nitrogen, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and there's some nitrogen in there. And so these are the pheromones that are being produced. So there's just slight differences typically in the length of these molecules uh, and you can see different uh, moths, like the big round, the biggest red circles represent uh, a lot of expression, right? They receive that particular signal really well. And then down here we have Litalis and Latura, the last two down here. And they can sense a number of different chemicals in their environment, but they also receive a number of different chemicals that none of the other species do. And what they've shown in that other paper through all those wild and crazy figures and all the testing they've done is they've shown that that olfactory receptor number 75, all right, is modified to be able to receive signals from different pheromones that other moths don't produce.
And that's one of the things that isolates them and makes them different than the other species. Okay, I think that I think we better just wrap it up there. Um, the main point was to just show you that if when we now that we can sequence so many genomes, what we're running into all the time are examples of these things where two similar species to other species have additional copies of genes. And when we look really closely at those additional copies of genes, we recognize, oh, they're actually very similar molecules to, to another gene that's already in the genome. And this is one of the ways that new genes are formed, right? They start out as something that's an exact copy of another gene. But then just like speciation happens between species and populations, genes will speciate, right? They become different genes as they accrue new mutations. Now, many times there's mutations that just knock out the function. And we can see that also in these genomes. They have extra copies of genes that they're no longer using because they're broken or maybe they're just completely lost. But at the same time, they're losing some genes through, you could say, a form of genetic entropy, right? There's just mutations that, that um, block, hurt the particular gene in terms of its function, but the organism still survives, right? So those, those capacities for that organism are lost. But at the same time, they're duplicating genes and some mutations are providing new beneficial mutations, beneficial in the sense that they're creating new functions, all right, for that particular organism. So there's sort of this loss and a gain at the same time going on at all times. Um, and these originations of new genes then, the longer the time has gone, all right, between their common ancestry, the more differences they accrue, the more different the genes functions may become. So at first their functions are almost identical. And then, so in this case, the genes have, uh, they can, they can uh, sense like five different molecules, that receptor. And so they both can receive five different recept, you know, five different molecules. But then one of them has a mutation, and now it only, you know, senses four of them. Or maybe mutation causes it to sense another molecule better that it couldn't sense before. And so they begin to drift away. And so at first they're sharing some of the sensory information some of the sensory needs of the organism are both being performed by the same gene that's two copies. But over time, the two copies become so different that eventually they're going to perform completely different functions. So you might wonder, where did uh, olfactory receptor number 38 come from? Because it senses a completely different pheromone, all right, different chemical in the environment, different than all those other chemicals that I showed you on that list, right? It's responsible for something very different in terms of the response of the organism. But that olfactory receptor gene has a lot of similarities to the other olfactory receptor genes. So if you go back farther in time, what you'd find is olfactory receptor number 38 is simply a copy of some other olfactory receptor gene. And if you go back far enough in time, the 72 copies, the 72 different olfactory receptor genes probably all come from one olfactory receptor gene that then copied itself, copied itself, copied itself, copied itself, copied itself, copied itself right? Uh, to the point where there's now dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of them. You and I have hundreds of olfactory receptor genes. We only use a very small number of them because most of our olfactory receptor genes are non-functional, broken versions of genes. Um, but you and I may even differ in this, uh, between some of our olfactory receptor genes because of duplications that are actually in uh, between different human beings. All right, that's it. That's one way that uh, new genes are formed. In this case, it's a tale of two copies. The two copies diverge to claim two functions, and this is a way new genetic information is obtained by organisms um, through their history. Thanks a lot for listening. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.